fantastic. Uh, so I would strongly recommend that we should watch that. So apart from economics, uh, he's also a, a motivational speaker. Uh, you will really get inspired after listening to that. Uh, he has a presentation to make, so I don't want to steal much time from uh, his presentation. We want to hear him, his views, his thoughts. Uh, before I hand over to you, I just want to make three points quickly. And this is one which is bothering all capital market participants, uh, people like us, because that impacts the market. Point number one, we all know that our government's revenue uh, is going to be significantly lower than the projections were, given what has happened. We also know the expenditure is going to go up. The percentages vary. Uh, I have done the average of many reports which are there, the estimates which are there on the street. Um, it comes to around three and a half to four percent. We can take both revenue and expenditure adjusted. Uh, what is the plan to meet this deficit? Uh, so that's point number one. Number two, like 2008-2009, when we faced a similar kind of crisis, India was less impacted than the rest of the globe. Um, we started to uh, monetary easing. Uh, which is what we have done this time around as well. Uh, it does have its side effect. Uh, you know, subsequently we have seen the implications of that. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts around that? And number three, which I'm sure is close to your heart, is uh, there are a number of very creative and constructive suggestions in your very innovative economic survey which we put out. Um, the thought process, meditation of some of those uh, suggestions. I leave it with that. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the Secretary General of PIKI, uh, and I will turn to him to make his comments towards the end. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, Sunil. Uh, audible? Yes, absolutely clear. Uh, very good afternoon to all the participants, um, and thanks a lot to PIKI and to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, along the three points that Sunil mentioned, I'm going to cover the last one in detail and the first two we can cover um, you know, as part of the uh, Q&A. So what I want to focus on is a theme that I think has gotten only uh, strengthened by the events that we've seen, uh, you know, through COVID-19. Of course, the motivation for what we wrote in the economic survey was, um, you know, events uh, happening after the global financial crisis. And in India, uh, no one, of course, anticipated the COVID-19 episode. Uh, I'll also talk about um, the emphasis on Atmanirbhar Bharat and the perspective that uh, that I have on it, and I'll illustrate these ideas uh, by focusing on something that I think is extremely critical for uh, for the growth of, of our economy, which is the banking sector. So um, if we could have the presentation, uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, one thing I want to actually you know, focus on, um, if you look at economic history um, across the ages, uh, philosophers, uh, economists, um, and thinkers have always, always focused on one key question when it comes to society, which is how do we make sure that private greed um, enables social good, and that private greed does not damage, um, you know, create problems for for social good. But how do we tap into private greed? to ensure that that enhances social good. This is a question that has bothered you know, thinkers over the ages. If you go and read um, you know, Aristotle, Plato, you look at read some of the Indian uh, thinkers, you know, whether it's uh, Kautilya or uh, you know, uh, down south, someone whom we are, all, of, all of us actually, especially in the south, really worship, uh, Thiruvalluvar. Uh, and you know, I'm just uh, taking a few examples. Um, among ones that I have personally read, but I'm sure there are others that I've not read who also have focused on this question. And this question, I think, becomes really critical now 
given what we've you know witnessed uh, with the COVID. So uh, what I want to do is something that we had highlighted. You know, this question: How do we uh, ensure that private greed enables social good and does not undermine social good? This is something that you know India found very good answers to it, to, to, to it in its history. And this slide actually shows that. So uh, something that we you know this, what, that we highlighted was the very first slide in the economic survey because something that is really critical. Those of us who have been educated in Western universities oftentimes just assume that economics starts with Adam Smith. Um, while some of the mathematical you know, uh, aspects may actually have come in the last years, and some of the idea, ideation might be actually due to Adam Smith. But India you know, had um, these ideas fructified in its in its literature, and I actually am careful to use the word literature, not scriptures, because anything that is part of the written word for me is part of literature, and that is not just the kind of journals that some of us have actually, uh, you know, had the opportunity to publish in, but anything that is the written word. So this is uh, work by Madison, you know, not, um, you know, not a Desi economist, which some of us may actually dismiss, but by a you know, by a Videshi economist who basically showed that India accounted for one third of world's GDP for almost three quarters of economic history, existing economic history. And you'll actually see this chart is not up to scale, but up, but up till about 1750 AD. And, you know, the reason for that and something that I'll actually emphasize on um, and, and, you know, um, and, and, and elucidate further is the emphasis on ethical wealth creation, not just wealth creation, but ethical wealth creation. And this is, you know, um, from Tirukural, the uh, verse 753 in chapter 76, uh, which is wealthy lamb unfailing speaks to every land, dispensing darkness at its at its Lord's command. Um, that emphasizes the importance of wealth in you know, Indian society. If you move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, the idea that actually led to this dominance um, was actually a marriage of, you know, two things that is extremely critical, you know, for India to 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 ahead, to ahead, which is that we cannot continue to undermine the market. You know, uh, in our uh, 50, first five first five decades, we did not adhere to the benefits that markets bring. And that's something that we are undoing, you know, since liberalization and a lot of the reforms, some of the ideas that, that uh, uh, Sunil ji had mentioned also in the economic survey, which many of which have been implemented in the Atmanirbhar Bharat package, are about actually unleashing the power of God. Um, but at the same time, what we also need to recognize is the role of trust. The reason being, you know, the COVID episode has highlighted beautifully that markets do not function well 100% of the times. Markets function well, you know, 90 to 95% of the time. There are periods like the global financial crisis, like, you know, the COVID episode, when markets do not function. And that's when the role of trust in the economy, and when I say trust is actually is, is, a, is a very broad idea which brings in governance into it, something that, you know, economies that have done well are typically done by actually adhering to you know principles of good governance, which then engenders trust in the economy. So this is something that is captured, you know, again um, as, I, as I was mentioning, while we all you know think about Adam Smith, Arthashastra actually you know many many uh, centuries back wrote that the root of all wealth is economic activity, and lack of it brings material distress. Is in the absence of fruitful economic activity, which is basically what. We need now both current prosperity and future growth are in danger of destruction. But at the same time, the role of trust, which is basically something that the COVID episode has highlighted. So take the words that I've you know that I've uh, uh, brought it to your attention. Wealth yields righteousness and joy. However, very important caveat: the wealth acquired capably without causing any harm. I think those of us who would have. Uh, seen videos of the really clean Ganges during lockdown, um, of seeing you know the Himalayas from Punjab, um, would vouch for the you know for the last phrase, which is wealth acquired capably without causing any harm. So climate change and its ramifications 
and economic activity that respects climate change is actually captured by this very short phrase, phrase which is without causing any harm. Um, and that's a very important principle that we, I think, you know, uh, uh, we have to learn. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we're having to face crises to be able to learn these things which have been very much there in our, you know, in our heritage. And um, hopefully, at least going forward, we don't need to rely on a crisis to teach these some teach these essential principles for material prosperity, which is ethical wealth creation. Uh, so, in this context, I want to speak about the you know emphasis on Atmanirbhar Bharat. If we move on to the next slide, um, Atmanirbharta, you know, uh, which is basically translates in uh, you know in English as self-reliance, has to be contrasted to self-sufficient. Um, Self-sufficiency is what we tried to do uh, up until the 90s, you know, till you know, when, when we liberalized. We tried to basically isolate ourselves from the rest of the economies. Now, there's a big difference between self-sufficiency and self-reliance. What Atmanir Bharta is focusing on is self-reliance. And here's where you know, it's really important to, to understand, as I said, that both COVID-19 and global financial crisis have highlighted the limitations of markets. Note the bullet that I put, you know, very carefully. It says markets don't work five to ten percent of the times. Only five to ten percent, not ninety percent. So in India, we've often made the mistake of thinking that markets don't work ninety percent of the times. Markets work ninety to ninety-five percent of the times very well. They do not work five to ten percent of the times. That's the nuanced point we have to remember. But these five to ten percent of the times also highlight some of the potential vulnerabilities that countries face, and that's why self-reliance in, in some key areas is essential. But, and this is a very important point, that self-reliance cannot be built without cutting-edge capabilities. Um, and capabilities themselves cannot be built without competition. So let me take, take an example. All of you, you know, the conference actually, participants, I'm sure most of you are from Bombay. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you actually know about the institution that all of us are really proud of, IIT Bombay. Uh, suppose IIT Bombay, and just a thought experiment, you know, IIT Bombay came up with this policy and suppose, you know, it so happened, God forbid if we ever will, uh, but suppose it so happened that the rich people in Bombay managed to convince IIT Bombay that, you know, it, it's only our kids that we, will basically get admitted to IIT Bombay, no JE exam, nothing, you know, just basically uh, you know, uh, those kids in Bombay, those that can actually, you know, um, from the upper echelons get into IIT Bombay. Uh, you can imagine then the quality of, you know, that will result in IIT Bombay. The point I'm referring to is competition. You know, the fact that the best kids from all over the country compete at such, you know, and, and such a hyper level, such hyper level of competition to get into a top institution like, like IIT Bombay is what then builds their capabilities. In other words, you know, and, and that's why these kids then go on to become the Sundar Pichai of the world um, and many others because they actually have the capability which competition has created, and that's why they have the ability to become self-reliant. I, th I think this is extremely critical without competition, and there's a very important message thereby I have for Indian industry that you know, capabilities are never built in, in, in isolation. Capabilities are built by competing with the best, rubbing shoulders with the best without having any insecurity. And, and that's basically what, because insecurities and confidence cannot, you know, cannot basically coexist. So uh, capabilities, though, also are built by utilizing comparative advantages. And that's something which is, is really critical. Um, India's comparative advantage, and I hope, you know, the participants here will, 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 will acknowledge that uh, India's comparative advantage lies in its large domestic market. Which so far, you know, despite people like uh, uh, C.K. Prahlad, you know, talking about the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, remains largely unutilized. Um, FMCG sector is an exception. Um, you know, FMCGs and the shampoo sachets are always talked about as you know, kind of fortune that is that is at the bottom of the pyramid. But what is the, the lesson that you know um, a lot of lot of us can take away from there? is that those at the bottom of the pyramid also want to avail products and services that are similar to those 
that are in the richest 25 percent but their price points actually need to be you need to be better for instance they can't make the upfront fake payment for the entire you know a bottle of shampoo that's why the shampoo sachet enables them to actually access the same product so there is a message here which is you know because of the cash flow the nature of cash flows at the bottom of the pyramid so the same products and services made available to them you know at, at, the, at the at the correct price points and maybe at the correct volume can make a difference because this is an important comparative advantage that our firms need to focus on so far the focus has been on you know those products and services that cater, that cater primarily to the top 25% uh, so there is an important opportunity to the scale economy economy is a scale that you know catering to india's large market provides can enable our companies to craft their products and services and thereby you know and really refine it to be able to make it you know globally competitive so this is also then very very related to ensuring that that we basically compete with the best and 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 you know become self reliant and shed any inhibitions we have of being able to not compete another important point actually you know uh, that that i would say i'll again take the example of of iit bombay there are very very poor kids that come to iit bombay these kids do not basically complain about x y z that they actually the environmental you know factors that they may face as a, as a drawback instead they just take it upon themselves to say whatever drawbacks you know i have i will surmount them with just my drive and my effort there's an important lesson that people in bombay therefore need to be learning from kids from you know in such institutions to not blame external factors and basically seize the the initiative and and, and just work on you know on on basically as as uh, alama ikbal said khud hi kar buland itna ki har takdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud pooje bol teri raza kya hai that's the spirit which basically iid bombay you know and 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 the institution that we all are proud of actually um, should should imbibe in india incorporated and the kids there actually i i would urge some of you to actually go and talk to the the brimming confidence that these kids exhibit say we can conquer the world is something that india inc can 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 learn from what i want to now do is actually just take one example of where we really need to implement this atmanirbharta where we need to shed our inhibitions go and take risks and really expand and that is in the banking sector so um let, let if you move on to the next slide <laughs> this is something that we highlighted in the last in this economic survey that uh, that the current slowdown a large part of it is because of the problems in the banking sector one can you know talk about other impacts but what we showed using very careful evidence is that the problems in the banking sector the npas and the risk aversion and the decline in corporate lending then had an impact on investment uh, the impact of the, the decline in investment slowed down growth with a lag and the slowdown in growth then actually has had an impact on consumption in other words we basically are have been caught in this chak chakra view now which is induced by the banking sector that lowering of investment has lowered growth that has lowered consumption by this you know lowering disposable income and thereby because of lower consumption anticipation of lower consumption investment is down and so on we basically are in this in this cycle of what caught in this chakra view so you know the because the banking sector has been an important uh, you know and and in every economy banking sector becomes is a very important part we really need to be focusing on making this you know the scale of in any other global economy and the capabilities of any other global economy and that's what i want to focus on because it's so critical for 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 economic growth uh, if we move on to the next slide <laughs> this slide actually shows where we are and where we need to go um, every economy if you take japan you know in the 1980s in its ad japan had about you know close to 18 or 19 banks in the top 25 the top 25 banks globally of that 25 banks were japan Japanese when Japan was at its heyday. Today, China. If you look at China, you know China has 18 banks in the global top 100. US, of course, has 12. In other words, you know any economy that is uh, that is sizable enough has been built only when the banking sector itself has large banks. 
And this is one area in which India lags behind spectacularly. And there's a lot of work that is really required here. India has only one bank in the top, global top 100. And you know, in, if you take countries that are one sixth and one eighth of India's size, countries like Denmark, Belgium, Austria, etc., these are fraction of our size. They have one, you know, bank in the global top hundred. Uh, countries that are similarly one sixth, one eighth of our sizes, like Switzerland, Sweden, etc., Singapore, they have actually far more banks than we do. So, in other words, by far the most important aspect for our economic growth is the banking sector because we have actually in the banking sector both a scale problem and a quality problem which is you know when we try to achieve scale we actually do not end up doing lending in the right way because banking sector is also about allocating capital to the really good quality projects projects and that both of these are extremely important and what i'm going to emphasize is after actually convincing you that this is something Banking sector in India needs to be global scale, and that's something where technology can play a very important role. To move on to the next slide, next slide. Um, you know, same thing, just being, just showing you in a different way. Uh, look at the, if you look at the private credit to GDP, look at China as a positive outlier and India as a as a negative outlier. Um, you know, when you take the take development, which is basically the uh, you know per capita GDP. If you move on to the next slide, uh, similarly, this is um, yeah the previous one was population. This is GDP per capita. Here as well, China is a positive outlier. India is a is a negative outlier. So you know across these slides, I I think you know it's it's very very clear that the banking sector is really something that is holding back our growth in a significant manner. Something that we really need to focus on. Um, next slide. Now, I mentioned about quality of, of lending. So we have, you know, we have both problems. One, when our banks lend, lend to the large corporates, um, you know, the, the, they, they typically end up not doing a very good job of, you know, of, of um, lending. This is not just the recent, you know, banking sector crisis. Even in the 90s, we had a problem like that, uh, where we got resolved and growth, you know, after the, after the 90s, you know, in the mid 2000s or so. There again, we had a problem of you know loans to the large borrowers actually not doing very well. The quality of, of allocation, especially to large borrowers, you know, not being very good. Now, here's where what I actually am really convinced about is the role of technology, of data and analytics in the you know in, in enabling this. That you know by really leapfrogging on technology. Our banks can achieve both scale and quality of lending. I'm going to show you some evidence of this, and I say this with you know being agnostic with you know both private sector and public sector banks. Before my PhD, I worked with a private sector, you know, uh, which was a, a DFI at that time, and that is a bank now. You know, my exasperation with the banking sector is equally with both the public sector and the private sector in their lack of use of technology. You know, even today, the use of data analytics, etc., for large corporate lending is still, uh, you know, we are very far from the frontier. While we, while we are using data and analytics, you know, for retail lending, but being able to use that for corporate lending is not adequate. This slide highlights this point that I'm saying. You know, if you take data around 2013, 14, and you just looked at the the uh, quality of financial statements of the large defaulters, the 12 defaulters, you know, it would have been you know, uh, clear like chalk and cheese. Each of these companies had severe problems in the quality of their financial statements. Now, this is something that, you know, and having done banking myself, the quality of the financial statement is the first check that a banker is supposed to do. And here, data can really help. If you look at you know, defaults and repayment of borrowings, insufficient provisioning or impayment of loss, non-compliance to provisions of the Companies Act, a bunch of, you know, bunch of stuff, all of which could act, data could have easily pointed out. And yet, you know, we basically did not use enough data. At least this round, I hope the banks can learn the lesson use data to be able to actually achieve both scale and quality of lending. Move on to the next slide. Um, if, we, if we look at today, what we see is 
the this is you know what we are showing here is the incremental credit deposit ratio and the incremental um, in, in, the in, incremental credit deposit ratio and the incremental um, i think the can i see the slide there it's getting hit by the can you do a show on that please yeah incremental investment deposit ratio so the blue line is the incremental credit deposit ratio and the yeah, and the yellow one is the incremental investment deposit ratio and what you see is you know last year around this time you know every 100 rupees of credit that came in you know uh, the amount of 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 uh, of 100 rupees of deposit that came deposit that came in banks actually gave about 50 rupees less of credit so 100 rupees came in they basically shrunk credit by about 150 rupees you know in the last year same phenomenon we are seeing you know over the last during the lockdown though um, you know on the emergency um, you know credit scheme of the that that was part of the atmanirbhar bharat banks are doing a very good job so far about 1.3 lakh crores of credit has been sanctioned but overall if we look at we basically see that the you know the deposit that is coming in is actually getting invested a lot lot more and you know all of you would know about how money is being put in reverse reverse the operations of rbi and you know when this could have been actually lent out so this is a, the the scale problem the risk aversion problem and the quality of of allocation of bank you know of of uh, bank loans all of these really need to be focused on and i think technology is something that can play a very important role i'm not you know this is not to to deny some of the other roles that you know of of governance and uh, other aspects but i want to emphasize on on technology we move on to the next slide this this is a study that was done for for banks you know before the global financial crisis and and what it shows actually on your left panel is the median npas of those banks that were low in it adoption versus those that were high in it adoption the red one is basically those that are low and the blue you know is those that were with high it it adoption the right one is basically the share of loans that was basically scaled by pre global financial crisis assets so the right slide captures right right chart captures scale the left chart captures cap captures you know the quality of lending what you notice is just simple simple it adoption actually enabled both scale and quality of lending there's a very very important lesson here in for our banks independent of whether they are private sector or sector or public sector while the private sector banks have actually focused on using it for retail use for corporate lending actually has been very very low in fact some banks have actually decided you know maybe uh, you know have not developed the capabilities and therefore have decided to stay away from from corporate lending altogether and and this is something there is an opportunity to use technology data analytics to be able to you know, to, to do this so the idea that we you know pushed on in you know for the economic survey was the use of fintech um we move on to the next slide so you know here before i move on to this slide i will relate uh, something you know that i had the opportunity of when i did my btech uh, btech thesis so those of us you know in the fourth year we have to write a thesis so this is more than you know uh, many years more than two decades back at that time i remember actually you know working on the application of neural networks for electrical engineering problems um in other words you know uh, neural networks which is basically was the precursor to artificial intelligence was you know it was was you know, being used in research about two and a half decades back uh, today of course you know neural networks and many other machine learning a lot of other algorithms have really made huge headway the reason i brought up this personal anecdote is to say that despite some of these being in existence for 25 years you know our banks have not looked to utilize this and the reason i actually bring this up is many of you would have you know those of you who are interested in chess would know how the you know the 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 uh, deep thought which was basically created using you know artificial intelligence and machine learning and by the way remember that you know deep thought was not even given the rules of chess it was just fed chess games the you know in in the in the chess coded methodology 
it learned the rules of the you know of the game and learned strategy tactics etc to defeat the highest elo rated player ever gary kasparov now compared to the strategy and tactics that are applicable in chess the strategy and tactics that a willful defaulter may be using is is kiddish you know and, and I, i can say this based on research that i basically and my interest in chess so i'll emphasize again the strategy and tactics used by willful defaulters are far far less complicated than what is required for chess you know and in strategy and tactics the point here being that if ai and ml can actually help you know uh, defeat a gary kasparov then you know a far simpler version of deep thought can really help even defeat willful default and that's the key idea that a data bank should be for should be focusing on you know for instance public sector we could do this using the public sector banking network by pooling in data but even private sector banks can actually look to utilize you know a lot of the data sources that are coming in you know and transaction level data and others to both you know infer not only the willingness not only the ability to repay but the willingness to repay as well today there is enough research even capturing the, the willingness to repay you know of, of borrowers and and which is basically one key thing that distinguishes between willful defaulters and distressed defaulters it is the willingness to repay and data today can be utilized to actually to 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 you know uh, so so banks can utilize some of this to be able to get into large corporate lending especially those banks that have enjoyed success you know in using data and analytics in retail lending they should be thinking about using some of this for large corporate lending as well because you know without the use of fintech you know we will not get the scale and the you know and the quality remember by the way we will not get the scale unless we have quality because if we don't have quality we will have these you know periodic episodes of you know pressing on the accelerator and then pressing on the brake and then again keep going we can't consistently push on the accelerator unless we actually have you know very high quality lending so atmanirbharta and actually capabilities um, in this an ethical wealth creation in the banking sector i think is the by far the most important for our economy as i said earlier no large economy has been built in the world without the banking sector really contribute and taking not just contributing but showing the way for the for, the, for that economy and you know india aspires to become the third largest economy the third largest economy in the world cannot be built by a banking sector that we have currently which is far lower to its current size so um, once again just to summarize my thoughts um, i think the, the the last two crises the global financial crisis and the covid crisis is highlighting the role of ethical wealth creation um, and and that's you, you have to see uh, you know atmanirbharta in that context uh, you know of the, also thinking about self reliance as departed from self sufficiency and that does not come about without capability building something that the banking sector in india really needs um, i'll stop there and uh, you know be be ready for for questions uh, be happy to take questions this was, this was brilliant fantastic and i i totally agree with you i think we do need um, stronger larger and more competitive and agile bank and bankers um, and that's re- required for the growing economy and the large economy the size of ours we got 5 minutes so let me summarize the number of questions which i have uh, got uh, from this has a question from media and also from uh, other participants so if i were to summarize all of them into one part i think what they are trying to ask you as to uh, um, are there going to be more and other fiscal measures uh, not monetary we have had enough of we have good monetary measures and that had started showing its impact positive impact uh, more on fiscal side and what's the plan of the government to bridge this gap of reduction in the revenue increase in the expenditure which means the larger fiscal deficit so any indication on that if you want to share so i've just clubbed all the questions into one uh, sure i think you know um, i could have done the presentation just on this aspect itself but i thought you know from a long run perspective emphasizing on 
what I did I, is, is uh, more important. But in the you know um, immediate context, this is something that is important. I have two main um, you know observations to make on this. First, um, and I've maintained this consistently, that um, you know as the Chinese premier Deng Xiaoping used to say, I don't care about the color of the cat as long as it catches mice. What do I mean by this? You know, let's just just take the GDP formula, which is you know if you use the expenditure approach, you know Y GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M, which is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. When you have credit that is that goes in the economy, credit will either you know appear as consumption or will appear as investment uh, because eventually you know the uh, entities that get that credit will you know give it either as salaries to their employees who will then go and spend it on consumption you know or they may actually go and purchase raw materials from you know or from suppliers who themselves may use it for you know so eventually when you track down at the end the liquidity as well even credit that is given you know, will appear either as C or as I. Okay, and that's why you know we also track the the, the the money supply in the economy because that eventually affects either consumption or investment. So you know, while I un understand the uh, you know the emphasis on fiscal spending, I do want to, you know to, to mention that from the perspective of you know eventual GDP and GDP growth, you know what we care is the combination. Of all these these four parts, C, I, G, and X minus M. The fiscal question just focuses then on the contribution of G to this entire. You know, um, now here again another another key point that I've been emphasizing, and I think now we're starting to see some good signs. Is you know the role of uncertainty in the you know in the in in, in this, um, which is. And, and you know Joseph Stiglitz wrote about this as well. Um, if you look at the PMJDY spending too, this you know captures the point that I'm going to make, which is the impact of uncertainty on demand, especially demand for discretionary items. So um, I th you know I will emphasize again that the government will be willing to you know is willing to actually do what is necessary in terms of government consumption, but the timing of this is extremely important. And you know now it seems like now it's a news coming that vaccine may actually not be very far off. You know once we have the vaccine, then the uncertainty that people have will really go down significantly. And till we have the uncertainty, even if people have you know money in their pockets, they may decide to actually keep it in their banks as saving accounts. And that's what I I was referring to as the increase. The PMJDY balances by about twenty thousand crores. This is important because you know the PMJDY accounts are typically those accounts where the marginal propensity to consume is very high, almost close to one. This is just economics jargon for you know for hundred rupees, how much of that gets gets consumed. The marginal propensity to save is typically very low. Even in this, basically, these there has been significant saving, about five hundred rupees. In other words, the question is not about if. The question is about when, uh, and and the, I think the right point would be if some of these what we are seeing the vaccines etc really come through in the next few months let's say and thereby the uncertainty goes down I think the time would be very right for for there to be this then a fiscal push which will really generate the demand even for discretionary items and this chakra view that I mentioned earlier. You know, one of the trigger there, and I do clearly recognize to get out of that chakra view, demand is important. You know, I'm not going to deny that at all. You know, uh, counter cyclical fiscal policy is important, but the timing is also as important to ensure that the bang for the buck is maximized. Um, so uh, I'm very, very sympathetic to the question. But at the same time, I hope, you know, you're able to see actually the intellectual arguments on which. You know, I'm actually talking about the need for focusing on when, and it's not about if. Thank you very much. We will just thank, the left for our thank you, Dr. Subramaniam, uh, for uh, uh, that excellent uh, you know presentation focusing on ethical well creation trust, um, and of course the 
important thing or cutting edge of competition with your IIT <laughs> example and the using of technology to improve the scale, uh, quality, and, and actually uh, the whole system uh, of, of the banking. Again, more importantly, saying that yes, uh, some fiscal measures are under consideration, but the timing depends on what happens in the future. Uh, it was a great pleasure to listen to you. All the participants, actually many more questions came up to Mr. Sanghai, he just summarized them brilliantly in one question. Uh, thank you for your presence, participation. As always, you stimulate, have stimulated a raw thinking and created an action uh, for the future. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Sanghai, for chairing it. And thank you, Jyoti and Abha, for putting this together. And thank you. And we conclude this session now. And we will go on to the next session very, very shortly. Thank you. Stay well. Stay safe.